Thank you, Brother. Sure, be mm -hmm. really a, a privilege to have Brother Branham come yeah. so often to Phoenix. I think he comes to Phoenix more than anywhere, and we want him, him to keep coming just as long as I'm around here anyway. <laughs> God bless you, Brother Branham. Thank you, Brother Williams. Good morning, friends. I am... Um, this uh, the Shakarian family. Uh, Brother Williams and Sister Williams and many of them here know about it. I saw that in a vision about two or three years before she got sick. It happened. And last year when we were here, I believe it was in January at the convention, um, is the time that that priest, uh, what's his name? I forget his name now, was here. Stanley. Stanley, Bishop, Stanley. Bishop Stanley from the Catholic Church. You remember when he brought me the Bible, you know? And he said to me, it was several prophesying, my daughter, you're healed. And he knew that the vision had said that she would not get well. She would die between 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. Remember that? Yes. So 2 or 3 o'clock, and I couldn't tell demons. And yet I told her stepmother, right over in the room, right across the place here, I said, she isn't going to get well. Mr. Karen said, well, everybody's prophesying. I said, of course, I could be wrong myself, but I said, it's, she isn't going to get well. I told many of them about three years ago, I saw her running for her life, and she w went into a bed, and she raised her hands and screamed to me like that, and I, I couldn't even reach her. And then I seen her die, and I looked, there's something, there's a clock, and it said, it's something between 2 and 3 o'clock. And um, so uh, the bishop said, well, I'll just watch and see how that comes to pass. <laughs> so it did come to pass. We are certainly sorry. I feel the church has lost a great person, Sister Florence Sicarian. But she was a great singer. She was a spirit-filled woman. I was with her mother. Her mother was one of the first uh, contacts I had on the West Coast when her mother was healed, uh, when the doctor, she's in a coma and all swollen up. And so the, the doctor that was there told me, said, now be real quiet when you pray. Don't make much noise. The woman's dying. And I said, yes, sir. And, said, and just kept on telling me. And, well, I didn't even have a chance to open my mouth. like So his brother Demas uh, Told me to go ahead and go up and see her. So I went upstairs and Florence was kneeling on the floor. Then a beautiful little girl and some more women and went over and prayed for her. And it's told and she was unconscious and told her she'd get up again. And she did. A couple of years later, she died. And now God answers our prayers. And we know that we believe that we are all have come here by the will of God and we lead the same way. One by one, will each one cross that portal? And that's why we're here this morning, gathered together in this Christian Businessmen's Fellowship, is to speak of these things and prepare for them, because we know they are sure to come. Uh, Sister Florence is a young woman, 42 years old, Brother uh, Williams just told me, and very young, but before they... She knew that she had this disease Why, I saw a vision of her and told me her outcome. Then it would be, uh, God knows all about it, and her seeing Jesus in the room before she left. We just don't want to pray for her because we've done that so much. We just want to thank God for a life that was among us that inspired us all, the Sister Shakarian. And we want to pray for Brother Demas, Sister Rose. And you remember, they've had an awful hard hit in their life in the last... This is his father and his sister now in, his, in the last years. And yeah, less than less than 10 months. And um, sister, his sister Edna also. So I know how to sympathize with Brother Demas. I had a father, brother wife and baby to go within a few days apart. So I, I know how he feels this morning. You only know when you stand in them shoes. That's when you know how to sympathize. And 
I did that myself. Excuse me. I hit a little gadget down here somewhere with my hand. So I'm, I'm sorry I got it too loud and not meaning to. So let us stand now while we, if you can, if it's... Let's bow our head. Heavenly Father, we have assembled here this morning to worship Thee and to give Thee thanks and praise for sending Jesus, our Redeemer, that we have a hope after this life is over, seeing that it's so uncertain that we live here all the time. And Father, to see the wretched conditions these bodies can get into, we're glad we don't have to stay here all the time. Thou hast made a way of escape down through the valley of death. Father, we are grateful to you this morning for the life of one who stood with us less than a year ago singing your praises, Sister Florence Shakarin, as we knew her. And thou hast told us long before even years that this was going to happen, that it wouldn't be too much of a shock for us. And we know what you say is true. Then your word says a man that is born of woman is full of few days and full of troubles. We know that's true too, Lord. We know we all must come down through that valley. So we thank you for her life that was here on earth, and believing by faith that now this morning she has passed from this miserable pest house into a glorious body which can never be sick, and her talents of singing and the voice she had and her spirit so richly in grace with Christ that she could return this morning. She would not do it by no means. She would have to go through all this again, which now it's over. She's with her mother and her daddy. They call her a baby home. So we... We thank you. We also want to pray for comfort for our brother Shakarian, our dear beloved brother, knowing the, the life that he's lived and the torments he's going through in these last days and how he's seen aging and his hair slipping away and his shoulders stooping and yet trying to stay on the field for God. God, give him strength today. We pray, God, that you'll grant it. To all of those who are bereaved over her going, we pray for each one. And let us, Lord, as we are thinking of this, remember that we too must go someday. While we're sitting together here, the presence of the Lord Jesus we would ask that you would bring this fresh to our memory and let us check up as it was or take inventory of our own lives, that we be under the blood and in the faith. Grant it, Lord. Now, as I try under these circumstances to bring a little message to the people today, I pray that you'll help me, Lord. Strengthen me, for I, I, I need it, Lord. And I pray that you'll grant it. And may something be said that would just honor you. And if there be any under the sound of our voice this morning who is not ready to meet the hour that lays before them, may this be the time that when they'll surrender to him who said, I am the way, the life, the truth, even our Lord Jesus Christ. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Be seated. Uh, the brother here wants to know if everyone can hear all right. He's got two mics on. Is that all right? Can you hear? Raise up your hands if you can. Can you hear? Raise your hands. I'm sorry that we do not have seating room for everyone this morning, 
And uh, we trust that I won't stay up here too long, just enough to maybe bring us maybe a reading of the word that the Lord God will honor his word that's being read and will give us of his grace that we might serve him by. Now, I was told by Billy Paul this morning that it might be possible that we speaking next Sunday at the Grant Way Assembly of God in Tucson. If there's anyone here from Tucson, I might not get to see you this week, uh, be at the Grant Way Assembly of God next Sunday. So now, we just come back from up in the east, and I kind of will run myself down a little by <laughs> overeating with overkindness of the people down in the mountains, and, and um, I got sick, and so I haven't felt good this week, so <laughs> you pray for me. And uh, what I say? <laughs> Brother Carl Williams with his sense of humor, and I think we need it right now. He said, too much possum. <laughs> I don't know about that, Brother Carl, but a whole lot of squirrels. <laughs> so you want to pray for someone this morning? Why, I, I certainly appreciate if it would be some of your prayer for me because I, I need it. Now, we want to go quickly into the Word, and I don't want to keep you here too long because I believe there is a telephone hookup uh, across the nation on this this morning. It goes all the way from the west coast to the east coast from north and south. Many, many assemblies have got this accommodation that you all had here from the tabernacle. It's also hooked up in Phoenix. That everywhere the services is, it comes right in uh, to the... And they gather in churches and in homes and things like that through a very fine way. They say it's even better than a broadcast. It's uh, the telephone hookup. They put a uh, receiver or, or microphone or whatever it is in the room. And they, my wife said coming from Indiana last week down to Tucson, it's just the same as standing right in the room. So we pray that God will bless all those out on the line this morning, wherever they are, up in New York. Now it'll be oh, in the afternoon and uh, different times uh, as it crosses the nation. Now over in the book of Romans, the 12th chapter... And the first and second verses, we wish, wish to read this scripture. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and perfect, per, good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, if the Lord willing, I want to take a, my subject for this morning on God's power to transform. That you might not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, improve that which is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. It's an old familiar text that many of your pastors has used down through your time. It's been used since it was written. But yet... One thing about the Word of God, it never grows old because it's God. It never grows old. Through every generation now, for prayer near about 2,800 years or better, this Word of God has been read by man, priest, and so forth, and never does it grow old. I've been reading it myself for some 35 years. And each time I read it, I find something new that I looked over the first time. Because it is inspired. It is God in letter form. See, it's the attributes of God speaking for, forth and is placed on paper. Many times man said, well now, man wrote this Bible. No, the Bible says itself that God wrote the Bible. It is the Word of God, and it, um, 
It never can fail. Jesus said, heavens and earth will fail, pass away, but my word shall never fail. And it cannot fail in being God because it's part of him. And then you being his son and daughter, you're a part of it. And that makes you a part of him. So that's why we come to fellowship together around the word of God. Now this word transform. I looked up in the dictionary yesterday when I almost lost track of the time that I was to be up here, uh, when I was looking at, for a text, and I found this word, or this text rather, scripture, and in the dictionary it says that it's uh, to, something that's changed. It's to be changed, transformed, made different than what it was. It's been, it's character and everything has been changed in it to transform. And I thinking this morning in Genesis 1, this world was without form and it was void. Darkness is up on the earth. Nothing but a complete chaos. And when this world was in that condition, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water and the entire picture was changed from a total chaos to a garden of Eden. That's transforming power of God that can take something that's nothing and make something wonderful out of it. God's transforming power. And we understand that I, by reading the scriptures that God was 6,000 6, years and making this preparation for this Eden. Now, he might not have been that long, but just presuming and taking it from the scripture, where it said one day with God is a thousand years on earth. That is, if God should count time. And uh, say it was 6,000 years he had in making the earth, and he had uh, planted upon the earth all good seed. There was just everything was perfect. I think many times when even critics begin to read the book of Genesis, they begin to criticize it because it seems like it constantly repeats itself or throws you out here and there. But... If we would just notice for a moment before we get into our text that Moses saw the vision and God spoke to him. God spoke to Moses face to face, lip to ear. Now, he never spoke to any other man like that as he did Moses. Now, Moses was a great, one of the greatest of all the prophets. He was a type of Christ. And now God can speak. He has a voice. It's been heard. God can speak and God can write. God wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger. He wrote on the walls of, of Babylon once with his finger. He stooped down and wrote in sand one time with his finger. God can speak. God can read. God can write. God is the fountain of all uh, grace and power of all divine wisdom is in God. So therefore, knowing that he is the only creator there is. There is no other creator but God. Satan cannot create at all. He only perverts what's been created. But God is the only creator. Therefore, he created by his word. He sent his word so all the seeds that he had placed upon the earth, he farmed those seeds by his own word, for there was no, nothing else to make the seed out of. He had placed them, and they were beneath the water. He just said, let there be this, and let there be that. Now we find out that many times it looked like the Bible repeating or saying something to what it doesn't say. For instance, in Genesis 1, we find that God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. 
And then he goes on. And many things happen upon the earth. Then we come to find out there was no man to till the soil. Then God created man out of the dust of the earth. That was a different man. And he breathed the spirit of life into him and he became a living soul. The first man was in the image of God, which is spirit. John 4 says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But God is a spirit, and the first man that he created was spirit man. And he was in the image and in the likeness of God. And then he put this man in flesh, and man fell, so then God came down and become in the image of man, that he might redeem that fallen man. That's the real gospel story to my, to my opinion. Now God in 6,000 years had planted all these wonderful seeds or he had spoke his word. It shall be this way. This tree shall be. This shall be. Everything was perfect. It was just good. And he commanded each one of those seeds that they would be, they would transform themselves into the plant of which kind of life that the Word of God has spoken in them should be. If it was an oak tree, it was to bring forth an oak. If it was a palm, it was to bring forth a palm because the great Creator had just sent forth His Word. And the Word seed was there before the real seed was ever formed, and the Word formed the seed. See, He made the world out of things that does not appear. See, He... He made the world by His Word. God spoke everything into existence. And being God the Creator speaking all things into existence, it must have been a perfect world. It was a, a beautiful place. It was a, a real, genuine paradise here on the earth. Now, as ever, place has to have a headquarters somewhere. Uh, this convention has a headquarters, and uh, this chapter has a headquarters, and a church has a headquarters, and God has a headquarters. And um, so this great place, nation that we live in, it's got a headquarters. And so this great Eden had a headquarters, and this headquarters was headed up in the Garden of Eden, or in Eden east of in the Garden, and God placed over this to rule all His great uh, creation here on earth, His Son and His Son's bride, Adam and Eve. God was the father of Adam. Adam was a, the Son of God, according to the Scriptures. He was the Son of God, and God made him a helpmate out of his own body, perhaps a rib from over his heart so she'd be close to him, and made him a helpmate. It really wasn't his wife as yet, no more than it was man as yet. He had just spoke it, and there's where the trouble come. Satan found her before Adam did. So it was just his word he had spoken. I say that. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but some of you might get a bit confused, especially some of the people up in the, out in the South seem to find this a little confusing on the message that I have from God today to the people that um, about the serpent seed. And I'm going to Go home, the Lord willing, one of these days at Jeffersonville. I want about a six-hour message and straighten it all out. See, so it'll put it just in form that you'll know what we're speaking of. And it's, thus saith the law. It's just as true as it was when you seen our sister Florence before she went away several years. See, it's the truth. And now, we, uh, maybe it's misunderstood. If somebody would come to me something contrary I would kind of misunderstand it myself. I wouldn't want to criticize what anyone says. We're not to criticize each other. I'm not guilty of doing that. I thank the Lord. I've criticized sin and unbelief, but no individual persons. See, I, I, we're, we're brothers and sisters striving. We're coming down to where Sister Florence came uh, 
yesterday morning. Saying, see, we, we all got to come that way, and it's not my purpose to, to try to uh, criticize a brother or sister that wouldn't agree with you. No, far be it for me to do that. I don't think you'll ever find a tape that I ever call anybody's name on, uh, which I felt that many times the person was wrong, but that's between them and God. But what is wrong in the way of sin and, and misunderstanding? Sometimes it's not even sin. It's just misunderstandings of people. And I, I think each one of us has a right to express ourselves to our understanding. Now, this great creator had placed his created son. Now, Adam was his first created son. Jesus was his only begotten son. He, he was begotten by a woman. But uh, Adam was right straight from the hand of God in the creation. Now, the headquarters with his, his son and his son's bride over all, it looked so perfect. There was a, a man, the head of all of it, his own son and uh, his bride, and every seed was perfect. The palms and the oaks and the grass and the birds and the animals and everything was in perfect order with the commandment of God, don't change your nature. Bring forth of its kind every seed. Oh, don't you never be perverted into a, a pawpaw tree. See? Palm, don't you be perverted into something else. But every seed after his kind. And he... He had watched it through the times that he had spoke the word and his great creating power had formed these things that come up and even the man and the woman and they were the head because they were the they were super to all the other races and he put them also under a care of the same thing that he put trees, animals and so forth, his word. They must not never by no means break that word. They must stay there. Don't never take anything from it or add anything to it. You must live by this word. And as long as that creation would have existed like that, Sister Shakarin wouldn't have had to have went this morning. As long as it would have stayed like that, God's great economy, it's what we believe that we're headed back to. We're going back to that spot, that place, for that seventh morning, God looked upon it all and he said, it's good. I, I'm pleased with it. I, I'm glad I did it. And it's all now under control. And I have put trust in my son and in his wife that if they'll make them head of all of it, that they'll watch over it all and see that it's all right, that everything will bring forth of its kind. Now, he has the power to do that. God then said, well, if it's all so good and it can't be anything else because it's my own desire. It's the way I want it. And I spoke it that way and my words has brought it just exactly the way I wanted it. And there it is. It's all good. So the Bible said God rested the seventh day from all his works and everything under control to bring forth of its kind. Now remember, to bring, when he put the seed in the earth, the seed can only come forth with the power of life within it to transform it from a seed to a plant or whatever it was. His transforming power. Now God put the seed in there with potentials that it would be what he said it would be. And as long as it stayed in its right category, it would be just exactly what God said it would be. It had to be that way because he had made it that way and made a channel that anything that stays in his channel, in his line of word, it will have to bring forth exactly like his word said it would be. Amen. It cannot move. It's channeled just exactly right. So with everything and the trust in his own son that it would be that way, then God said it's all good, so I'll just rest. 
And each one of those seeds has power in itself to transform itself into the species that I desire it to be. That's what it must be because I have given every seed transforming power to make out of itself in its potentials now to make out of itself exactly what I want it to be. God has never changed. Just the same today as He was then. God's determined to do something. He'll do it. Nothing's going to stop Him. He'll do it. Now, after it's all so well and set in order, God felt assured now that this would all be all right. And then when He did, then came in the enemy. I'm going to... God gave power to transform, and I'm going to call this fella with power not to to create again, but um, he had power to deform. Not transform, but to deform. Now, anything deformed is taken from its original state. There's something that's gone wrong with it. Some years ago on patrol, going up through the cornfields, uh, I would think of a, there was a, a limb that broke off of a tree. And it fell over on a stalk of corn, and the stalk was trying its best to get up straight like it was supposed to be, but it was deformed because that something had happened. And uh, the stick was laying over it. Then we find a wild creeper in the field, which many of you men here, maybe some of you women, if you come from Kentucky, the women uses the hole there the same as the man. Uh, get out in the field with a, with a hole, we call the old gooseneck hole, and chop the, the creepers out. For if you didn't get those creepers out where the corn was in the row, like this, then that creeper would reach over, grab a hold of that corn and wrap itself around gradually, so easy, so slyly that you hardly tell it was wrapping. And finally gets stronger and stronger. And it pulls that corn till it's deformed. Pulls it against itself. Wraps it around its own vine. Deforming it from what it was to something else. Yet it's corn. But it's deformed corn. And we are all still in the image of God. But some are so deformed as sons of God that walk contrary to His Word and to the way that, that He had us and provided for us to walk. It's letting something the world twist us out of the way, pull us close to it and away from that straight, narrow strip that He planted us in to be sons and daughters of God. Sin has done this evil thing to the sons and daughters of God. The deformer. I know this seems to be rather strange to speak of it in this way. The, the deform. But that's what he was. He deformed our perverted. Pervert means to be changed over, made something different. And uh, deform is the same thing that it's been brought over and deformed and made in a, another way. Yet it's still the same seed, but it's deformed. Now, we find that this deformer has also had the same amount of time to deform as God had to transform. Now, he planted his seed, or never planted his seed, he, in the Garden of Eden. Since that time, he's had 6,000 years of deforming the seed of God, the Word of God, to deform it, make it something different. When he, the first time that Eve listened to him and got herself just one little phrase, remember, first Satan quoted that scripture just as clear as it could be, God has said that ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden of Eden, see, you shall not eat of every tree. And, uh, 
Remember, now, Eve said, yes, we may eat of every tree, but the tree that's in the midst of the garden, we mustn't even touch it. Now watch him in his message, twist that word just a little bit, and saying, he said, for God said that if we do this, that day we die, he said, oh, surely you'll not die. See, he was a, a man, he said, you, you do this now, and you're, you're kind of an ignorant people. You really, you don't know all things. But if you would only partake of this, then you would have wisdom. You'd have knowledge. You know right from wrong and be like gods. You, if you'd only partake of this wisdom that I have. I know, but you don't. But it's all right to have wisdom. But if the wisdom is contrary, if the wisdom isn't correct wisdom from God, divine wisdom and becomes natural wisdom, I don't care how much science we have and want more education, it's of the devil. I'll prove it to you, Lord willing, in a few minutes. It's of the devil. Civilization is of the devil. I just got through preaching on that. All culture in the earth, all the powers of science and everything is of the devil. It's his gospel he preached of knowledge in the Garden of Eden. And he's took that knowledge, perverted knowledge, contrary to the word and will and plan of God. And now he's had 6,000 years to do just exactly what God did, only in a perverted way, and took the same amount of time to bring his own Eden in. Now he's got an Eden here on earth. And it's filled with wisdom, knowledge. That was his gospel at the beginning. Knowledge, wisdom, science. Never did God ever cater to such. And I, I want you to watch a minute. He did this. And because it, he was a man of worldly wisdom. Now, it's hard to say this. It's, it's very hard because speaking to people who feel the same way I do and the way I have been for many years, but since the opening of those seven seals of the angels just behind the mountain yonder, this has become a new book. It's the things that's been hid as being revealed as God promised in Revelation 10 He would do it. And we are the privileged people that God has chosen of the earth that we might see and understand these things, which is not some mythical fleshly mind of a person trying to make it up. It's the Word of God made manifest, proven that it's right. Proven not by science, but by God that it's right. God, as I have said before in a message, God doesn't need anyone to interpret His Word. He's His own interpreter. He says it'll happen, and it happens. That's, he, he confirms it. That interprets it. A few years ago, when we Pentecostal people, when the, the other churches told us that we were crazy, we could not, the Holy Ghost was a thing past, but we find out that God's promise was to whosoever will. And now we know different, see? That's just little by little, this thing has opened up. And now He promised that the mysteries that was hid in those, all of those church ages would be revealed right at the end time. And it lets us know now we are at the end time. Amen. We're here now. Now, Satan is the author of civilization. He is the author of science. He is the author of education. You say, is that true? All right. Let us read in God's Word now, Genesis 4. And let's go back and just see for a minute. I know I may, if I get too long, Brother Carl will probably tell me. But I, Genesis, the fourth chapter in the 16th verse, goes ahead telling here in the beginning what God did in order to place the curse upon the man and the woman 
And all that they was to do, not the curse on them, but tell them what would happen to curse the ground for Adam's sake. And we find out here now that Eve had a pair of twins. And one of them was of Satan, and one of them was of God. Now you say, oh, oh. no, now, Brother Brant, just a minute. You find me one scripture anywhere that says that Cain was Adam's son. I'll show you in the scripture where it says, Cain was of that evil one, not Adam. Now notice when she conceived here, we begin at the fourth chapter first, and Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten, she said now, I have gotten a son from the Lord. Of course, it had to be, no matter if it was a prostitute or anything, it had to come from God. See, because that's his seed. It's a law of his seed. It has to bring forth. Whether it's corrupted seed, perverted seed, or whatever it is, it's got to bring forth anyhow. It's his command. And she again bare his brother Abel. No more knew him. Adam knew his wife. And she bare Cain. And also bare Abel. Twins. Satan was with her that morning. Adam that afternoon, you see the big fuss in the paper here, I believe it's Tucson now, that woman bringing forth a colored child and a white child at the same time. She lived with her husband that morning and the man that afternoon, and the man would take care of, the white man said take care of his own child, but the colored man would have to take care of his own. See, I know that in breeding of dogs and so forth, it certainly will, if it's in a few hours afterwards. This proves it. Now, to show where civilization come from, now let us read Genesis over here uh, uh, in the fourth chapter of Genesis again and see where the 16th verse. And Cain went out from the presence of God and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east side of Eden. And Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after his son Enoch. Civilization stuff. Dr. Schofield here in my Schofield Bible says the first civilization. Notice, then he begot sons, and they made organs and music. The next one begot sons, and he began to do other things, wonders, build cities, and, and make uh, instruments of brass and all kinds of things. See, that's what he did, become the first civilization, which was Canaanite. He's done the same thing down through the ages. Now, let's get there with the 25th verse and watch what the next was. And Adam knew his wife again. Now, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said, she has appointed me another seed instead of Abel who Cain slew. And Seth, and to Seth to him also... There was born a son, and he called his name Enos, and then began man to call upon the name of the Lord. Out of the Seth side, not the Canaanite side. See? That great intellectual that we all so hold to. What's communism today? What's their God? It's the intellectual science. What are we doing anyhow? Why are we living? Consider these words today. Now, he has his kind of an Eden. Satan does now in these 6,000 years. He has formed, not created, but deformed. God's whole earth is creatures, the animals. Interbreeding, high-breeding, trees, plants, human, even to religion, the Bible, church, until he's got himself a complete garden of Eden of science. Everything moving by science. Our automobiles, everything that we have was given to us by science. What man has done. And he's got his great Eden here to prove the message is timely. To prove that it's not some other age but Revelations 10. Look at the high breeding today to make a better or prettier, not a better. Look at little children today. 
I had my daughter to a dentist yesterday, and he said her teeth was twisting. Brother down in Tucson, Brother Norman had his little daughter, and her teeth was bucking out. And the dentist says that soon, he believes that maybe in times to come that people will be born, teeth growing anyway. It's the food that we're eating. Hybrid food. Did you read Reader's Digest last month about Billy Graham, the noble evangelist? Have you been listening to him? I pray for him now more than ever when he's talked to those turnaround collars and so forth the other night, leaning on that clergy. Something's happened to him. One of these days, I hope he sees his position where he's at. Notice. Now, it's calling from Sodom, that perverted city. And now, notice this. In Reader's Digest, Billy had gotten so weak that he couldn't even hold his meetings. And they told him he had to run, take exercise and so forth. Sure runs a mile each day, I believe it is, or something to get exercise. Man is rotten. The whole human race is corrupted. Everything is like it was in the Antiluvian time. It's completely upset, turned around. Different from the straight road that God planted them in. Sin through science and deception has twisted the whole human race. Did you read also just below that article where it said in, in these days that little girls and boys are in their middle age according to physical structure between 20 and 25 years old. Think of it. The sermon the other night I picked up a girl 22 years old in menopause. Called her out, and that, that's what her doctor told her. See, it's a fallen, degenerate, hell-bound race of corruption. I know that sounds not ethical, but it's biblical. That it is true. This race that we're living in, this generation of people, now. Notice today, high breeding, cattle, high breeding, plants. And science comes right back around the same science that does it, says that it's what's destroying the whole human race. You read it the same as I do. Well, why don't they stop it? It's because that they can't stop it. God's Word has said it would be that way. But if they think for a minute, they're the instruments, as Judas is carried, placing exactly the thing that God said would happen, it's doing it. Just exactly on their own basis of science. By his scientific research, in the same pattern he deceived Eve, he also has deceived the church, which Eve was a type. Now, now, Adam, a type there again, or ye, brother, of the church, notice what it did. Through the wandering for knowledge, she slipped across the line between right and wrong by listening to Satan's perversion or deformity of the original Word of God. And now, the church of today has become deformed. Now, I'm not talking about the peoples, the individuals. I'm talking about the church world. One's twisted one way and one twisted another. And by science. Same pattern that it is. He has carried out his threat. Satan has of Isaiah 14, 12. Let's just read that for a minute. In the book of Isaiah, let's begin the 14th chapter, 12th verse. How art thou falling from heaven, O Lucifer? Son of the morning, how art thou cast down to the ground which diddith weaken the nations? This is Isaiah seeing him in a vision, see, in the age to come. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will set also upon the mount of the congregation the side and the north. Satan's purpose from Eden was to make his own self of Eden and exalt himself above so the stars of God would worship him. So 
tongue of worshiping. And he's absolutely carried it out. Now, and when he's done this and brought it into the church, which I won't go in detail, any of you listen to them tapes, know about it. That, that's exactly the hour we're living in, and it's Satan that's done it. Through educational programs, better fit, better this, better that. And not knowing all the time they're walking right straight into death. Blinded. Leading the blind. Blinded leaders of the nation. Blinded leaders of science. Blind leaders of the church. Blind leading the blinded. Jesus said, let them alone. They will both fall in the ditch. Here, notice the type of the two Eden so closely typed together to almost deceive the very elected. Matthew 24, 24 said that it would be that way. But I want us to stop for a few moments and consider these two Eden. And one thing especially, how the Bible tells us that God's Word did produce that Eden and how God's Word warns us. That the other Eden would come. Now, we also know that there has got to be another Eden. If we would also listen to the prophet Paul in 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter. I could read it if you want to. He who exalts himself, that day will not come of the Lord until that man of sin be revealed. He who sits in the temple of God, exalting himself above all that's called God. So that he, as God, is worshipped as God. Think of that. Now, Isaiah 14, the prophet said that he saw Lucifer in his heart to a vision under inspiration of God, saying he would do that. And Isaiah, 800 years before Paul, or approximately that. Now, here, 800 years later, Paul sees him, comes to his position. Notice, it heads up his Eden, his scientific Eden with his scientific world, with a scientific bride church, all under the, the word of knowledge, great seminary, great degree, educational program. Listen, brother, sister. Each one of us is going to walk that road if Florence walked. I asked you in Jesus' name to consider this. Not consider me. I'm your brother. That, that isn't it. Consider the word that I'm speaking of God's Bible. And look through perfectly vindicated in God's own word in the age we're living in where we're at. These programs are absolutely antichrist in themselves. Now, he's got to have an Eden. He said he would do it. Here's a simple word of God saying he would do it. And here we look right out and see him do it. He's done it with his intellectual, scientific, denominational bride. He's going to take head one of these days in the World Council of Churches that will be set up. All will be with him. Kind of people, not because they're bad people. They were planted in that straight row like corn. But Satan sowed the creepers called science, research, education. Doctor's degree. Sometimes they won't even let you in a pulpit unless you can produce a doctor's degree from some seminary somewhere. It's all wrong. Not the people. It's the program that's wrong. And now what's it done? It's all headed up again and brought the whole entire world through a bunch of high-breeding perversion of the original seed of God to another Darken chaos. But I'm so glad that God is mindful of us again, that He can still move upon the face of the condition. 
He promised he'd do it and call a little flock, which would be his bride. Notice here again now how perfect these churches type, or these Eden. God do a seed of his word. And there's only one thing that can quicken the word, and that is the spirit. For it is the life giver to the word. And when the life in the word meets the life of the spirit, it produces whatever the seed is. Now, notice what's happened. In the Garden of Eden was God's economy of innocence. And that was one of the, um, the dispensations. The first dispensation was innocent. The people know no sin. They didn't know anything about sin. Both Adam and Eve were naked. But they were hid from their nakedness by a spirit veil over their face. They never knew that they were naked at all. Because they were hid for God's veil in their own minds. They didn't know what right and wrong was. And then both standing there naked showed that the knowledge had not yet come to them. That they were naked. The pair was naked and knew it not. Now, if you'll turn, if you wish you'll write it down, to Revelations, the third chapter, the Holy Spirit predicting this last age to the Lady Osea, Pentecostal, church age, in the last days, it said, Thou art naked and blind and know it not. There is God's seed under innocence, not knowing at all they were naked, under a veil of the Holy Spirit veiling them from sin. And now in the last church age, we find here that they're naked again and don't know it, but it's not the Holy Spirit veil. It's the veil that Satan slipped over Eve back there, a veil of lust, the lust veil. They are so filthy till they don't know that they are naked. Are women on the street with shorts on? Sexy dress. Someone sent me a piece in the paper the other day of this new dress that they're going to wear. I think 14 inches from the hips or something. And um, I wonder... If our, if our women folks does realize that that is a lust veil. Now, you, you say, I can prove before God that I'm innocent of any adultery to my husband. Or I, I, all this. But still, at the judgment, you're going to be called an adulteress. The Bible said so. Jesus said, whosoever looketh up on a woman... Who lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Blind, naked, and don't know it. Not them poor little women out there. It's nothing I got against them. It's that evil. And the system of the church seems to fail to recognize it or stand against it. Let them bob off their hair, wear makeup, and shorts and things under the name of Christianity. What a horrible thing it is. See, they're naked again in Satan's Eden and knows it not. They don't know it. I believe I see it perhaps looking across here the swimming pool at women out there now. If that woman only realized that what she's doing, but she doesn't know it. She's naked. Her body is sacred. She strips off the clothes that God clothed her with, with skin for this generation. She constantly cuts it off. She's naked under the word of civilization, higher education, better civilization, higher ethics. 
Let me be sure that this soak sin is all of the devil and will be destroyed at the coming of the Lord Jesus. Amen. It'll be destroyed, every bit of it. There won't be one thing left. Oh, friend, across the nation as you're listening to me here in Phoenix, think of those things. You are here subject to them. Now, Jesus said that they would deceive the elected if possible. The first spirit was a first veil was a holy veil, holy spirit. And she wasn't supposed to look out of that, but when Satan began to talk to her about knowledge, she just had to take a little peep at the world. That's exactly what her daughter, the church, has done. You have to see, you have to dress like uh, some movie star. Our young man has to act like uh, Elvis Presley or, or Pat Boone or, or some of those people. Under the name of religion, Pat Boone's the Church of Christ. Elvis Presley's the Pentecostal. Two demonized characters that stole the world in a worse chaos than Judas Iscariot did at the betraying of Jesus Christ. They don't know it. Them boys don't know that. Nothing that I have against those, uh, those boys. Man. It's the spirit that's motivating it. Just step over on that side one bit. Let that creeper just get one little hole around the shuck of that corn one time. Watch what takes place. The corn's gone. Oh, yeah. Done got him. And that's the way it'll do it. It'll do it every time. Eve had to take just one peep at the world. And let me say something to you, brother and sister. In 1 John, the second chapter in the 15th verse, we can read if you wish to. The Bible says, if we love the world or the things of the world, it's because the love of God is not even in us. Now, the word there is not earth. The Greek word is cosmos, which means the world's order. If we love fashions of the earth, the world, if we love the trend of the day, if we think this is a wonderful time, oh, we have all these things. If you think that, it's because your thinking is wrong. It is perverted by the devil. For if you love the world's order and the things of this present world, it's because the love of God is not even in you. Remember that. Oh, God, look what we're looking into. Here I want to stop just a minute and tell you a little story. I heard a chaplain from the First World War. They'd throw, um, like Satan at the beginning, when he come in to the Garden of Eden, he could not dig up those seeds. He could not destroy them, but he sprayed them with poison, and it deformed the seed. It didn't bring forth its right kind. It deformed the original seed. And that's what all these programs of religion, they're still sons and daughters of God, but being deformed. They go to church wanting to do right. A nun never enters a nunnery to be a mean woman. A minister never goes through school just to be a, a, a bad man. You never join church and shake hands, put your name on the book, or whatever you do in your church to be a bad person. You do that to be a good person. But it's the deception. It's the deformity that does it. Satan sprayed it. See? God never had an organization. There's no such a thing anywhere found in the words of God. God is our organization. We're organized in Him, a body, and God in heaven. That's right. Our names are on the Lamb's book of life. Notice. But, see, I know it's very hard, but I, I want you to suffer just a little longer, if you will. In the time of the world's war, excuse me for getting away from my subject, but to make this point, I, I wanted to 
give you my analysis of what Satan done in Eden. Spraying. Horrible. Poison. Spray. Would you like to know what that spray was? I can tell you I got the formula of it. Two words. Unbelief. Which is contrary to faith. Sprayed unbelief, doubt. And science filled its place where the cavity that went into the sea. Satan filled that cavity with knowledge and science and civilization. And it's deformed the whole entire creation of God. I know you think I'm getting you on a limb, but I'm on the limb with you. And we're all here to try to find what we can do. We don't say those things to be different. We must be honest. We each one come down to the end of the road where we're going to give account for every word. Right now we know that our voices, when we are born, the first little cry goes on a tape. It's going to be played back again at the day of judgment. Even the clothes you wear will be shown your face at the day of judgment. Even science has found that by television. Amen. See, television doesn't manufacture a picture. It only channels it. The color of clothes, every time you move, every thought's in your mind, is absolutely kept on God's record. And that big thing will be laid right before you. Every one of them filthy dresses you wore, every time you went to the barber shop, cut that hair that God gave you. It's going to be your answer for it. You can't make a move right there. It is even the thoughts of your heart while you're doing be played right before you. How you go to escape? How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? We're not going to escape. Ever move in the thoughts of the heart is recorded. Right in another dimension. Even the color of clothes you wear. Television, colored television, proves it right out, pulls it out and shows it. See? And that's just in an, one dimension from the three that we live in. Now, how the poison has struck the church, struck the earth, Satan's uh, poison upon the seeds has put cavities in it and caused it to be deformed. More and more he sinks deeper into the hearts of the churches and in the hearts of the people and everything. Science, science, until it's become a place for the human race by being interbred. I believe every seed should bring forth of its kind. And the human race and the plant and all being interbred has brought us to a place in eating our food from the earth which our bodies have made hybrid. It's put our whole minds. Now, if our bodies are falling at from 20 to 25 years old because of degenerated cells by hybrid foods, don't our brain cells degenerate? Isn't that cells also? That's why Ricky runs through the street here this hot rod or Ricketta, Elvitas, and them, as we call name, out here half naked before the people, mentally gone. No more conceptions of decency or morals. To my little story, this chaplain said, he'd been down in the hospital and said, so many boys lay in the tent, some of he just come from the outside. He said he went out there and some officer told him, he said, Chaplain, we want to ride out to take a look at the fields out there that throw this mustard and chlorine gas as they did in them days. And he said, I got out there, Brother Bram said, there wasn't a bark on a tree, there wasn't a sprig of grass. It was on an Easter morning. He said, there's some old wrecked tanks down there. The, the officer had to get record of them and see if there's anything could be done for them near the great Argonne Forest. He said, when I was standing there by myself, I looked up and said, Oh, God, this is the way it's all coming to. That's right. It's all coming to. It's all burnt up. No life, no word all. Grass burnt off the tree with that gas. Trees killed. Everything was killed. Twisted, hanging down. Where bullets and things riddled it. If that isn't a picture of the world today, where Satan spraying his unbelief, his high breeding, his science, his knowledge, until the, what it was. At the beginning, when God put Adam and Eve in the garden, that beautiful paradise without death, without sickness, without sorrow, and everything perfect in order, 
Look what Satan DDT has done. She's a chaos. There's nothing left in it. He said, I started crying. I walked back. I was attracted to a rock. That I just went over there and looked at the rock, pushed it over. Down beneath the rock was a little white flower growing. The only living thing left. Because it had been sheltered by a rock. God, my rock, shelter us today, O God. When these poisons are flying everywhere, in the name of science and education, shelter us. Keep me until that day, O God. It was my prayer. Now, I hope that we each one are under that rock, Christ. I just preached the other day, many of you heard it. I was going down through the woods hunting, and I was attracted to turn around. And I looked narrowly at an empty cigarette carton or package or what you call it. And it's the company, I don't feel I should call their name, but the tobacco company, had, they have a slogan, a thinking man's filter, a smoking man's taste. I started walking on down a little further in the woods, and something attracted me to go back to that cigarette pack. Oh, Heavenly Father, I'm going down here to that tree where those squirrels was spoken into existence by you one morning. Why would you call me back? And something said, you got a sermon coming for Sunday. Your text is wrote on it. Oh, on a cigarette pack? I went back, and I began to think, a thinking man's filter. What a deception that is. If a man was a thinking man, he wouldn't smoke at all. But you see, people swallow that. I believe it was two years ago, when I was in one of the conventions, I went up to the World's Fair when it was on the West Coast. And they had Yul Brenner's picture and many of them there, and the scientists, many of them is in the same hall, about the uh, danger of smoking, how they pull that smoke across a marble and tuck a little Q-tip and tuck up the nicotine off there and put it on a rat's back and put him in a cage in seven days. He's so full of cancer. He couldn't even walk. He said, pull it through water. He said, filter. He said, filter? There is no such a thing. He said, now this is science himself. They said, you cannot have smoke unless you got tar. Tar makes the smoke. And the only thing it is is a gimmick to sell more cigarettes from that if I don't I hope you think I'm sacrilegious or a fanatic, that devil in a man that makes him smoke to kill himself. When he, he wants the nicotine of one cigarette that will supply his desire, now the company comes around with this deceiving gimmick and says, a thinking man's filler, you'll have to smoke four or five cigarettes to make a much tar in you to satisfy him as you did with the one. Yeah. American. Selling death to their brethren and sisters. I don't get it. But yet in there I thought there is a thinking man's filter. That's right. Now, if a man was smoking, remember, it produces a smoking man's taste. Then if you cannot have a the feel the desire of a smoke until you get the smoke there. It get, has to produce the taste. So you smoke four cigarettes or five and pay more for it than you would just smoke one regular cigarette. See, it's a gimmick. A sales gimmick. Deceiving the people. Americans. When I think of Valley Forge, George Washington with two-thirds of his soldiers no shoes on their feet on that cold day. To make us the economy we are, and then American sell America and his brother and sister of death under a false gimmick. For a filthy lucre, the root of all evil, the crave of money, love. The whole thing's gone mad. Know not that this whole thing will perish. But 
If you don't get no smoke, you can't have the taste. Now, now I thought there is a thinking man's filter. A thinking man's filter, and I took my text from a thinking man's filter produces a holy man's taste. So I thought that our denomination has done a whole lot like that. Take people in, call themselves Christians, and just anyway. What? They get more in their denomination, our organization. We get more in there because we let them come in under this, that, and the other. Anything, it don't make a difference. So they put their name on the book and say they're Christian. That's all. All by faith you're saved. You have to believe the devil does the same thing. Amen. You've got to be born again, and that comes through God's self. Now, <clears throat> there is a thinking man's filter. I'm holding it in my hand. It won't produce a denominational taste, but it'll certainly satisfy a holy man. How could a bob-haired woman ever come through a this filter. How could a woman with shorts on ever come through it? Or slacks? Well, the Bible says it's an abomination to God for a woman to put on a garment that even pertains to a man. And how can a man that thinks anything of himself get out here and dress like a woman and let his hair grow out like a woman? Down his eyes with bangs and turled up like that? He's wearing his wife's underneath clothes. She's wearing his outer clothes. A thinking man's filter. A thinking man won't do that, or a thinking woman won't do it. God's Word won't let it pass through. There isn't one thing can pass through that Word. That's the Holy Spirit. And it brings the Word into you. And it produces a holy man's taste. Look at the day, Rick Etta, on the street, lovely, beautiful anatomy God gave to her. And Satan using it. And she'll dress so immorally, not knowing that a week from today she may be rotten in the grave. Coming down the street, you're not long ago with preaching a convention of the Assemblies of God over on the West Coast in a meeting out to the Southwestern Bible School. A little lady walking down the road with a little, them little clothes on, bikinis or what you call it, and fringe hanging around the cowboy hat and boots. I was going up the road. I thought, poor little feller, some mother and dad's child was put here to be a daughter of God and has become a bait trap of the devil. I thought, I believe I'll just turn around and go back and tell that kid. She looked to be about age of my Sarah there, 17 years, 16 years old or something. I thought, no, I better not. I'll just go up here on the road and pray for her. If somebody see me, stop and talk to her. I better not do it. Now, and listen, sons of God, you get in that same place. These Jezebels of the day play up to you. But a thinking man will think first. She may be so pretty, it may be I can make a hit with her. But it'll cost you your soul, boy. Yeah. Some of you girls to these Rickies, thinking man's filter produces a holy man's taste. You married man, when you see them women on the street like that, you sons of God, don't you realize what taken place in the first beginning when science had made women so pretty in the Andalusian world until the sons of God took daughters of man? Not daughters of God. And God never did forgive it. They destroyed the whole thing. Science, earlier. Used to be, a, you notice, the beauty of women lifting in the last days is a sign of the end. God's proved it. So use a thinking man's filter. You'll have a holy man's taste. It'll cost you your home. It'll cost you your position. It'll cost you everything you got besides that, your soul. It'll break up your home. You know, may have another man raise your children. Another woman raise your children. Take a thinking man's filter. It'll produce a holy woman's taste. When you start the barber shop or somebody and you tell you go to have a headache, you know, take a thinking woman's filter. What the Bible says then. And turn away from it. 
Don't you do it. I'm your brother. And I love you. Nothing I have against you. God knows. That's what makes me say the things I do is because of, of love of God for you. If a man go out there and they won't tell you, you know, pastor lets you sit around and act like that, he don't love you. He can't love you. I wouldn't want that kind of love for the women. I want to have a holy taste for my sister. I want to really be my sister. Not somebody, somebody talked about her being so pretty and how she is and little sex queen she goes to my uh, uh, I want her a lady. Oh, Lord, keep me under the rock. Yes. In Ephesians 5, 26, the only one way you can get through that rock, that's washed by the waters of separation by the word. That's right. Now, don't let this devil spray you with his education. No, no. It'll kill the influence of you. Don't let the devil take that, well, I belong to the church that my mother belonged to it, my father, my grandmother. Don't let the devil spray you with that. The Bible has already said on the seven church ages and things there, it's all gone to seed. Right? The whole thing is corrupt. The whole thing is a putrefied sower. Don't let him spray you. Say, well, it's higher ethics. We're more educated than we used to be in the old days. Don't you let the devil put that over on you. I've showed you his whole program is civilization, education, science. He's got it right into the church. And don't you listen to that. Keep your head out of them old dirty televisions and things. And... Our text says, be not conformed, but be ye transformed. Not go and say, I was confirmed Sunday. No, go in and be transformed right now. Transform from what you are to what God wants you to be. Now, it depends on what kind of seed that's in you. If an intellectual educational seed has been placed in you, there's only one thing it can do, deform you. That's all. To a son or daughter of God, the only thing it can do. People of the day, as I look out, they act like they don't even believe there is a God. Pardon this expression. If anybody feelings is hurt by this, I don't mean it. A couple of Sundays ago, I was invited by my own daughter to come in to a television set and to watch a religious singing. That Sunday morning, I wanted to hear old Roberts on his program. I told him, let me know. I said, you hear this? This is a great hymn saying. My son standing there told me about it, too. And I turned that set we rent from a woman that has the television in her house. I never intend to have one in my house. No, sir. I want that thing in my house. I'd blow it out with my shotgun. <laughs> nothing to do with that evil thing, no, sir. But... Tucker, let me tell you about your Arizonans, Jerry. You've seen that analysis the other day of schools, didn't you? Eighty percent of the children in Arizona schools are suffering with mental deficiency. Sixty-seven percent of them was by looking at television. How about that? You better use your shotgun. That's right. <laughs> now, don't let the devil spray you at that. No, sir. Now, people, as I said, uh, people act like they don't have to come to judgment. These boys and girls, they had some Indian family and a whole lot of stuff. I think a fellow named Mr. Poole is the head of it. And if I ever seen a modern mockery of hymns, it was the way they handled it. A bunch of Ricky standing there shaking their hands up and down. I certainly appreciate that young man here this morning and saying, look decent like a real man. Uh, I like that. When you, you businessmen sometimes here get a bunch of these rickies that stand here and hoop and holler and carry on and hold their breath till they're blue in the face. And That's not singing. That's just making a lot of scientific noise. Singing is melody from the heart. 
I thought, what a pity, what a shame it is. So, uh, how, under the name of religion, they act like there is no God. Someone said the other day to a boy goes with my daughter, Christian boy, said, give a smart remark about Adam and Eve. Said, Eve going through the garden, said, children, you see that tree there? So that's where uh, your mother eats out of house and home. Could you imagine supposed to be a staunch Christian that would take a promise and a word of God and throw it off to a hog pen? They act like they don't have to come to judgment, but God will bring every secret into judgment. Amen. They act like there's no God. I don't want to call him a fool because the Bible said the fool, uh, not right. Uh, Jesus said this, and don't call an old man a fool. But in Psalms 14, 1, the fool said in his heart, there is no God. Yeah. They, they're not, I don't want to call them fools, but they act like they are. They act like it. So you see where we're at today. Like there is no God. I belong to church now. Oh, the whole thing, the Bible is a big joke. Our church knows where they're going. Yeah. Right straight to hell. Exactly. Right on the road, right down to science and education, theological seminaries and things. Just brings them right down the road. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit doesn't have a chance to give a revelation or nothing. The seminaries don't got to cut out. Amen. The Holy Spirit's to lead us, not a seminary, not bishops and overseers and so forth. Amen. The Holy Ghost is our leader. Amen. Came with such a person as that. He was uh, very religious indeed. Now, if religion's all that you have to have, then God was unjust by condemning Cain because he was religious. He's just as religious and sincere as Abel was. Now, remember, he thought of God. He worshipped God. He had a church. He built an altar. He made a sacrifice. He prayed. He worshipped. But he was rejected. No matter how Esau was also. And religion, see, that's Satan's business. Not to kill the whole thing, but just contaminate it. That's all. He ain't going to kill the whole thing. Oh, not communism. No, no. The Antichrist is not communism. The Bible said it would deceive the elected if it was possible. Don't notice the iron curtain, but the purple one. <laughs> but notice, Cain come to worship, but he had the wrong seed in him. Serpent seed. The hiss of the serpent had hissed over him, for he was the seed of the woman. He knew the perfect will of God, but he refused to do it. Do you know that? Amen. Satan knows the will of God, but just refuses to do it. Notice, he had seen God vindicate Abel's message. I want you to think. Use your thinking man's filter now for a minute. Abel's correct message that God vindicated to be the truth. Are you drawing now? <laughs> Abel's message had been received. And Cain saw it. Amen. And know that God had vindicated that message right. Amen. But he just couldn't do it. Amen. His pride kept him from it. That's right. His pride kept him from doing it. He's seen God vindicate the message. So it seems to be now so hard for people to humble themselves to the Word of God. They just don't want to do it. They'll humble themselves to the creed of the church. Sure. But not to the Word of God. If you want to find this, you go to... i got a scripture here. That's what I'm referring to here. Genesis 4, 6 and 7. God said to Cain, said, Why are your countenance fallen? Why are you all full of temper walking around? You just heard a message that upsets you. <laughs> said, well, why are you doing that far? Why are your countenances fell? Because I didn't come into your church. Well, why did you do Are you using the thinking man's filter? Or why didn't... Why are you looking like that? Said, if you'll do well... Go do like your brother's doing out there. I'll receive you and bless you. 
I'll do for you the same thing. But he just couldn't do it. He said, now, if you don't sin of unbelief, laugh at the door. Now, when they tell us the days of miracles is past, they see it so perfectly vindicated and proved, you see. All these things that God promised he'd do in the last days, the Revelations 10, Malachi 4, all those things, so perfectly vindicated. What's the matter, brother? What's wrong? See? If you don't, unbelief, which is sin, there's only one sin. That's unbelief. That's right. You're not condemned because you drink, smoke, chew, wear shorts, do whatever you do. No. Now, I don't condemn you. It's because you don't believe. If you believe, you wouldn't do that. Yeah. Believer doesn't do that. He takes a thinking man's filter. Or a thinking woman's filter, either one. All right. But you see, seeing life at the door. Now, notice what that done to Cain. And it's going to do the same today. It made Cain go away a willful sinner. He willfully was disobedient. Every person will be the same way. Willfully disobedient. After he had seen Abel's message so vindicated of God that it was the truth and refused to do it. Done the same thing. Then... He crossed the dividing line. There is a line you can cross. You know that, don't you? Uh, ministers, both here and out in the, the telephone land where this broadcast is coming across the nation, do you realize that? When you see it's Scripture and you won't do it, God won't always... He, oh, you're going to be blessed. So is every one of Israel. They lived right in the wilderness and raised children... Crops and blessed and everything. But every one of them eternally separated from God. Jesus said so. Oh, yes, God will bless you right on. But you're gone. Certainly. That's what the Bible says. Now, that's what he said. Notice. You can cross a separating line. Do you believe that? Yeah. Can't it? Let, let's just turn over here in a minute. I got Hebrews 10, 26. Let's see if I can find that right quick. A book of Hebrews, the 10th chapter, and the... I believe the 26th verse, I got it wrote out here just a minute. If you bear with me, let's just read it. All right, here we are. For if we sin willfully, after that we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and the fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary. That's thus saith God's holy word. Yes. If we disbelieve willfully after we have seen it and heard it, then we are across the line. There'll never be no more forgiveness for it. You cross the line. I always say, God still blesses me. Oh, yeah. Remember Israel. The borderlines. When God gave them a promise over in the Holy Land, in the land it was good of milk and honey. And when... Moses sent out Caleb and Joshua and the spies to go over spies land and brought back the vindicated evidence. The ten of them said, we cannot do it. We're unable. Look at the difficult there. We'll be fanatics. We got these little bitty things to fight with. Look what they got. We, we can't do it. We're not able to do it. Joshua and Caleb said, we're more than able to do it. God made the promise. And remember, they turned back. That was the Kadesh Barnea. And they turned back and become wonders in the wilderness. And every one of them died and lost eternally. Jesus said so. Don't cross that separating line. When you know to do good and doeth it not to you, it's sin. Israel did the same. If they seen Moses vindicated. And then let Balaam spray them with that precious Vindicated seed. Pastor, don't you never say nothing against this word. Look at Balaam. He was a prophet. And he's seen the seed of God vindicated. But under his own great denomination that he lived in, Moab, seen that bunch of wonders coming through the land, he sprayed it and said, Well, wait a minute. We're all Christians, we're all believers. 
Well, our fathers and your fathers are the same. Aren't we Lot's children? Was Lot Abraham's a nephew? Aren't we all the same? Let's marry one another. And Israel, as Eve in the Garden of Eden, let Satan spray her. He also spread Israel through a false prophet. When the real prophet was with them with vindicated word. But by intellectual knowledge conception, he sprayed them. Think of it. Now, it was never forgiven. The sin was never forgiven. The seeds rotted right in the path of duty. On the road to the promised land, every one of them perished and rotted right straight in church. In the line of duty. Following God. And let Satan spray that intellectual spray over them. Educational, intellectual conception saying, Well, we're all the same. We're all children of God. You're not. But he let that false teacher there spray him with that intellectual conception that he had of it. And just like the ecumenical council is doing right now. Right? Same thing. Well, we'll all join together in one great organization. Your whole organizational systems of the devil. Amen. It's the mark of the beast in the Bible. Amen. I'll have a book on it pretty soon, the Lord willing. Notice, in Noah's time, seeing the word being erected to float. <laughs> Let me make a little remark. Here. The word being put together for to be transformed from the ground to the skies. Amen. Seeing the structure of the thing. But with their intellectual conceptions, laughed in the face of the prophet Noah when he was prophesying of the end time. But what did that structure was made of the word of God, pitched inside and out with prayer and faith? When the rains come, all the intellectual conceptions of religions died and rotted right in, the, right in their churches, Amen. right upon the earth. And the ark floated above it all. Amen. The scientific sprayed seed rotted right in judgment. What are we trying to do anyhow? Are we trying to establish our church or are we trying to establish the Word of God? What are we trying to do? What are we working at? Are we trying to get the people back into this? What's this great Eve trying to do here in this last day is this church Eve? I'm going to have to quit right away, brother, because it's, it's getting too late. Just give me just about 15 more minutes, and I'll stop on my, my scriptures here. No. All right. I know we're, the people probably don't get here clean this up. But I, it just seems like it's hard for me to quit. I'll hurry. All right. Look, the great scientific educational hybrid Eve today called the church. What's she trying to exude? Is she trying to exalt God's word and let the people do the way they're doing? They're not using a thinking man's filter or God's filter. Look what they're producing. They're exalting themselves. The church is in her deformed seed of knowledge program has caused the whole race to be scientifically ignorant of the Word of God. I'll catch those remarks. I'm not going to hold on them too long now to get finished. Scientifically ignorant. When God right here on the earth doing the things that He's doing by His promised Word. And they ignore it and walk away because they're scientifically ignorant. <laughs> scientifically ignorant. I was smiling then because of Brother William here wrote over here on a piece of paper. You stay here all afternoon <laughs> Something, but I uh, appreciate that. That's really fine. See. But uh, the people are are willfully sinning. It's brought the the whole system of church world today into a willful sin against God. Amen. What common decency approved to you is right? All right. A lust veil blinded her eyes to the word of God, and she finds herself naked again. You know, God in Revelation 3 said, Come buy some eye salve from me, that your eyes might be open. The eye salve is his word. You know, he say, Well, this man studied 40 years to get his uh, degrees. He's a B, 
and LD, DD, and all this. You know what Jesus said about that? He said, let a man deny himself. Paul did. You say, that don't mean that. Well, what did Paul follow up for then? He said, I'll never come to you with enticing words of man's wisdom because you'd build your hopes upon that, but I come to you in power and manifestations of the Holy Ghost that your word would be, your faith would be built on the word of God. Not the manifestations of a wisdom. It seems that people's lost their common decency and modesty. They're not like they used to be. It used to be when the prophet said, Thus saith the Lord. The people trembled. Yes, it certainly did. The people moved. For they were afraid. But now they lost all their scare of it. They don't fear God. Solomon said the, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of it. But the prophet can speak, Thus saith the Lord. People say, Nonsense. See, there's not a hope for them. It's, they say, well, we're smart. We're intellectual. We don't have to take that kind of stuff. We know what we're talking about. It's also an old proverb that fools will walk with hobnailed shoes where angels fear to trod. Certainly. Now, what is the transformation, quickly? How do we get it? What does the transformation? God does it by the spirit of his word. He transforms. He plants his seed, throws his spirit on it, and it brings forth the product. His Holy Spirit transforms the seed word in, to be vindicated of its kind. What kind of a seed you are that shows just what's in you. You can't hide it. Whatever you are inside, it shows outside. You just can't keep from it. You can't make that tree anything but what it is. It's, it's going to be that way. The Holy Spirit transforms the seeds that's on the inside of it. No matter what kind of a seed it is, it'll transform it. If it's evil, it'll bring forth evil. If it's a hypocrite, it'll bring forth a hypocrite. If it's a genuine word of God, it'll bring forth a genuine son or daughter of God through a thinking man's filter. When the seed comes up, it comes through that. It produces a son and daughter of God. One day when the world lay in the darkness of chaos, God... Now listen close, because we're not going to speak just a little bit longer. Look, one day when the world was again in all kinds of religions, washing hands, pots, wearing different robes and bonnets and so forth, it lay in the midst of another chaos. The genuine Israel of God had been so perverted from the laws and statutes of God. Jesus said, you with your traditions make the word of God of no effect to the people. By your traditions. Look at them holy priests, they call them. And Jesus said, you are of your father the devil. And his works you do. That's exactly what he said. Now, when the world lay in that kind of a fix, God's spirit moved again. Upon a seed that was predestinated. He translated and transformed Isaiah 9, 6 of its promise. He, God was made in human flesh to save that chaos time. When man was made in the image of God, here comes God by the prophet foreseeing it. Now remember, the word, the prophet foresaw it, just the same prophet that seen Satan in this last days. Of this educational program and things he has. Religious program. The same prophet... Isaiah 9, 6 said, Unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. And his name shall be called Counselor, the Prince of Peace, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. And of his reign there will be no end. And that word's God's word. And the Spirit moved upon that word and it formed in the womb of a virgin. Amen. A son is born. Not created, born. Satan tried and tried again to spread. it. He took him up and said, If you are what you say you are, then do some of this healing here for me. Show me how you can do it. Turn this bread and this uh, stones into bread. Let's see you take a dive because the scripture says you'll do it. You see them religious devils today still saying that same thing? If there's such a thing as divine healing, here lays brother so-and-so, let's see you heal him. 
that same devil stood at Jesus' cross and said, If thou be the Son of God, come down off the cross. The Word said he was the Son of God. The Spirit proved he was the Son of God. Isaiah 9 and 6 was fulfilled. The other night, many of you in the broadcast heard how that we have 60 some odd scriptures almost of the about proving that the scripture said that that was him. Oh, Satan tried and tried again. Do everything one night laying on the back of a ship. You see him asleep. He said, I'll destroy him right now, but he couldn't. He tried to tempt him into doing the wrong thing, but he couldn't do it. Why? He had been sprayed with the repellent of predestination. <laughs> it can't be deceived. No, no. The word said he'd be here. Amen. Amen. There ain't no devil going to bother him. Amen. No other son of God is predestinated to take his place. Amen. He's sprayed with a repellent. Satan's poison, denominational doctors don't even touch him at all. He moves right on. Nothing going to bother him. It didn't have any effect upon him. Well, I'll make you the bishop of all the earth. I have rule over it. If you'll just worship me, come on, join my group. I'll, I'll make you the ruler. I'll step down and let you up. He said, get behind me, Satan. It is written, I shall worship God the Word, and Him only shall thou serve. Then one day on this great person, I'd like to stay there a while. But one day the Spirit moved upon him again. Because there's some word have been wrote about him. Come from God to the prophet. And he was led to the slaughter like a lamb. And the Spirit moved up on him and led him and sent him to Calvary's cross. There he died. And everything that was spoke of him in his death was fulfilled to bring life and life to all the predestinated seed of God that was up on the earth. He brought the way to do it. Here is the seed. The Spirit brings the life. Transforming sons and daughters of God from the world in this dark chaos into be sons and daughters of God. Don't stumble at that word predestination. I know you do. But listen, it's not my word. It's one of God's words. If you want to read it, read Ephesians 1, 5, which he has predestinated us to the adoptions of sons through Jesus Christ. Just let me break it just a minute. Uh, and, uh, uh, just a minute to break this out of your mind. Look, just as you were in your father at the beginning, a germ seed. Do you know that, every one of you? You were in your great, great, great grandfather also. Do you know that? Read the book of Hebrews. Or that we find that Levi paid tithes when he was in the loins of Abraham, four generations behind him, when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, it was accounted to his great-great-grandson down below him. And he was then in the loins of Abraham. There you are. See? You were in the loins of your father, but your father could not have any fellowship with you until you was transformed into a body of flesh. My son there was in me. I, I, I wanted a son, but he was in me then. See? He was in me then. But through wedlock, he was transformed into a man like me. And then he become like me. And you become like your parents. See? Because it was in you to begin with. Now, if we are the sons of God, his attributes, which you are an attribute of your father, not your mother, your father. The germ lays in the father. And now, your mother was an incubator. That bear you, bear the seed of your father, see? And the earth and flesh is also the incubator that bears the seed of God, <laughs> see? Just exactly. Not the world, how great the world is, how great the God that made it. See? See? Now, if you are a son and daughter of God, then you were in God at the beginning. You're his attribute. If you wasn't there then, then you never was or never will be. Because I cannot bear a, from my loins the son of this man here. Or that man there. I can only bear my own sons. And they bear my likeness. Hallelujah. Is it? Sons and daughters was in God at the beginning. 
Now look, you've got eternal life. You say, we believe it, that we got eternal life. Well, there's only one form of eternal life, and that's God. That's the only thing it is eternal is God. Then if you've got eternal life, that life that's in you always was. And you were in the loins of God before there even was a world. And when the Word itself, Jesus Himself, is called the Word, and St. John 1 said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, then you were in the loins of Jesus and went to Calvary with Him. You died with Him, and you're raised with Him. And today we're sitting in heavenly places in Him, filled with His Spirit, sons and daughters of God. Die with Him, raise with Him. Sure. Now, then, now, now you can fellowship with Him. You couldn't back there because you were just a word in Him, a seed. But now He's manifested you. And now He wants you to fellowship with Him. Then He came down and was made flesh so He could perfectly fellowship with you. Amen. See the perfect fellowship? Amen. Oh, my, them deep mysteries of God. How wonderful. See, God could not fellowship in the Spirit, so God became man with us. Jesus Christ was God Himself. Manifest because He's the Son, because He was begotten, but it's just a tabernacle from the living. No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten of the Father has declared Him. God built Himself a house, a body to live in. Come down so that you could touch Him. First Timothy 3, 16, without controversy, great is the mystery of God, is for God was manifested in the flesh. Think of angels believed on, received up into heaven. See? Now, he, you being flesh and Him being flesh, then you can fellowship one another because He was God's attribute of love. God is love. Is that right? And Jesus was God's attribute of love. And when the attribute of love was displayed, which that was God Himself, all the attributes that hung on to Him, come to Him. All the Father has given me will come to me. Sure, it had to be predestinated. It wasn't, you won't be there, that's all. Certainly. Now we can fellowship us to the, the riches of His Word, and, and which you are a part of. You are a part of the Word. Because He was the Word at the beginning, you're the Word now. See, I'm preaching tonight, or uh, Sunday, or one of the days when I get in, about what the Word is. See, and now you are part of the Word. Listen, there's one thing I can't do. I can't brag on my ancestors. You know, i come through an awful mess. <laughs> my father was an Irishman. My mother was an Indian squaw. Half Indian. Her mother was an Indian, brought a pension. Now, all of them drunks. Most of them die with their shoes on, fighting. Gunfighters and so forth. I can't brag on nothing about that because my ancestors and my family tree is terrible. But, brother, there's one thing I can brag on. All right. I can brag on my Lord Jesus, Amen. who has redeemed me and with his transforming power planted a seed by predestination, and I saw it. Whose son am I now? <laughs> I can brag on him. And I've spent 33 years of my life bragging on him. If he'd spare me another 33 years, I'll try to brag more on him. I can brag on my ancestors. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ye that redeem me and planted the seed of life in here, let me look down upon this word, sent down his spirit and said, Here it is, speak this, it'll happen, do that. And then, oh my, I can brag on him. How did he do it? Through the washing of the water by the word. The water is a separation. Wish you could explain it. True predestinated believers will stay with the word because they are part of that word. Oh, wandering stars, how long will you wonder? You Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, outsiders, whatever you might be, wandering stars from church to church, from pillar to place, and television to television, world to world, why don't you come on? He longs to have fellowship with you. He's longing for you. He wants to transform you by the renewing of your mind. Not to the church or to the denomination, but to His Word, which you are a part, if that desire is in you. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. See? <laughs> and it's sent His transforming power to bring you out of this deformity 
of religion that you're in. In this deformity chaos that we're in, God has sent his transforming power, his word, vindicated, proven, to bring you out of this religious deformity of ignorance that you're walking in, naked, blind, miserable, and don't know it. Think of it, friends. You know, God sent his transforming power to fulfill his word and change the whole body of Sarah and Abraham. Transformed an old man and an old woman because he promised he'd do it. And what God promises to do, that he'll do. Amen. There's nothing, anything, any perverted thing, God can't do nothing with it. But he will keep his word. And he'll send his spirit. I, the Lord, have planted it. How watered day and night, lest some should pluck it from my hand. The Bible says that. Oh, wandering star, you with the desire in your heart, you've got to have it or you wouldn't be sitting here this morning. And you wouldn't be in those churches and auditoriums and things you're in out across the land if something didn't bring you in there. Some person spoke to you. Don't go any further. There's a washing of the water by the word that'll make you white as snow. Oh, sons of God, listen. Don't stay in that deformity. Come out of it. Abraham... Believe God and call anything contrary. You say, how would I make my living? How would I do this? That's God's business. How would I, my associates would turn me down? God said, he that will forsake his own his father, mother, wife, husband, homes, houses, I'll give him homes and houses. I'll give him fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters in this world and eternal life in the world to come. It's a promise, friend. That old, that's got to be watered. Every promise God makes comes to pass. Every seed of God is a promise. Amen. And sisters, stop bobbing that hair because it's an uncommon thing before God. Quit wearing those clothes. It's an abomination to Him. You brothers, you men, stop catering to these denominations and doing the things and letting your wives do such things. It's unbecoming to Christians. Come back to the Word. Take that Word. It'll grow. It's got to grow. God's transforming power that brought it up in the first place. He's just on his road back, taking it back again now. He's going right back again to where it was. Enoch was translated from death by God's transforming power. What did God do that for? For a type of the rapture in church that's coming. Yeah. Elijah was a saint. Jesus' body was quickened after it was dead. And in the grave... Jesus' body was quickened by the Word of God and transformed from a dead, cold image to a resurrected, glorified Son of God. Amen. Because the prophet, Psalms 16.10, if you want to put it down, 16.10 said, I will not leave his soul in hell, neither will I suffer my Holy One to see corruption. Amen. Oh, God, that Word has to come to pass. It's God's Word planted in your heart. If you want to go into rapture, if you want to be Christians, genuine, place this word as a, I believe it was Ezekiel, God said, take that scroll and eat it up. Yes. That the prophet and the word would become the same. Amen. Never promise in there has to manifest itself because it's God's original seed. Don't you let some educated theologian out here try to pump it out of you. Amen. Don't you let him spray you with that a carnal science and knowledge and education. Believe God. Abraham didn't take the scientific research of his days. Say, I'm too old to have the baby. I went too far. I've done this, that, or the other. But he called anything that was contrary to God's word as though it wasn't. And he spared not the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong, giving praise to God. He knew that God was able to perform that what he had promised. Oh, wandering sons, deformed by the creepers of this earth, wandering sisters, that the places and fashions of this world is drawing you, sister dear, you might consider me an old crank, but one of these days when you meet what Florence Karen met the other night, she sat in this room too in this place, as you know. When you meet that, you'll find out uh, not me, but this word is right. Yeah. Keep out of those barber shops, those fashion shops. Keep out of those things. Say, why don't you teach them great things, how to be this? Just start with your ABCs, and then we'll come to allergy. Yeah. Just start learning, which is your reasonable service. That's right. 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You just do your reasonable service. God will take care of the rest of it. Just to reason things that you can reason out yourself and do. Isn't it not... Isn't it unreasonable for a woman to strip herself down and go out here and act like that when the Bible condemns it? Isn't it unreasonable for a man to throw himself into such a dogma as we have today and all this stuff here and all this seminary stuff and stuff like that when it's absolutely contrary to the Word of God? Isaiah's lips. He was just an ordinary man. Unclean lips. He said, Lord, I'm among unclean people and I got unclean lips. Woe is me because of seeing God. And an angel come down, got the fire, holy fire off of God's altar, and transformed his lips from the lips of a wandering man to the lips of a prophet with thus saith the Lord. God's transforming power. 120 fishermen and and little sellers of purple of women and those gathered themselves in an upper room and closed the doors. Some of them not enough education to sign their own names. God transformed them from fishers to fishers of man, from men and women of the streets to saints of God immortal, the transforming power of God. Paul, a local church member, Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal or something. Down the street he went with his great de- defying spirit in him that he knowed more than any of them. He'd come up under Gamaliel, one of the best teachers there was in the land. What happened? On his road down to Damascus, get a bunch of people who was believing God's word. On his road down there, was stricken down, and he heard a message, and it transformed him from a church member and a church goer to a prophet of God who wrote the word of God in the New Testament. From a church member to a saint. Oh, wandering star, let's stop. Wandering sun, wandering seed that's going from place to place in this deformity. Turn this morning, children. Please hear me as, an, as a man that's trying to stand between the living and the dead. Out over the land where the broadcast is coming, if you're still hooked up. You have wandered into the place. Please sit just a minute longer. I know it's late. You're in Tucson or, pardon me, Phoenix. It's 20 minutes till 12. I've had these people here all morning. I've had you away from your work and things. But look, dear friend, you might be away from God forever. Please, come back this morning, won't you? There's room at the fountain in a manger long ago. I know it's really so. A babe was born to save men from their sin. John saw him on the shore, the Lamb forevermore. O oh, Christ, the crucified of Calvary. Oh, I love that man from Galilee, from Galilee. For he's done so very much for me. He's forgiven all my sins, place of Holy Ghost within. Oh, I love, I love that man from Galilee. A publican went to pray in the temple there one day. He cried, O Lord, be merciful to me. He is forgiven of every sin in a deep place place within. He said, Come see this man from Galilee. Right. The lame was made to walk. The dumb was made to talk. That power was spoken with love upon the sea. The blind was made to see. I know it could only be. The mercy of that man from Galilee. Type that with the ministry today. The woman at the well, he all her sins did tell. How far of husbands she had at that time. She's forgiven of every sin in a deep peace place within. She cried, come see this man from Galilee. Woman, he can do the same. He's read your heart this morning. Man, he's read your heart. Oh, publican. Let's pray. Oh, I love that man from Galilee. From Galilee. For he's done so very much for me. He's forgiven all my sins. 
place, the Holy Ghost within. Oh, I love, I love that man from Galilee. Won't you love him with me this morning? Oh, wayward, wandering sinner. Here or out where you may be, will you accept my Lord this morning? He is the Word, and the Word has been brought to you. Won't you accept him this morning? Will you just raise your hands or stand to your feet or something and pray that I want to accept him right now? Brother, I'm willing, I'm willing right now to accept him. Will you stand to your feet? Anybody would want to be prayed and say, I am a prayed for, rather than I am a sinner. I want God bless you, sir. Someone else. Everybody pray now. Just a minute. Oh, in that manger long ago is in a chaos, you know, the world was. And I know it's really so. A little babe was born to save men from their sin. When John saw him on the shore, he was that lamb forevermore. Same one today. Oh, he's Christ, the crucified of Calvary. Won't you love him today with all your heart so you can walk out of this worldly condition that you set in? You women, you men. Oh, what did you set your all this time for? It goes to show there's something down in you. There's something there hungering and thirsting. You wouldn't sit here these two or three hours sitting in this building like this. There's something. Won't you just heed to it today? Let the fashions and science and all the things of the world pass away from your mind right now, brother dear, sister dear. The churches are uniting. The great nations are breaking. Israel's awakening. The signs that the prophets foretold. The Gentile days numbered with horrors encumbered. Return, O oh, dispersed, to your own. The day of redemption is near. Man's hearts are failing for fear. Be filled with the Spirit. Have your lamps trimmed and clear. Look up. Your redemption is near. False prophets are lying. God's truth they're denying. That Jesus the Christ is our God. Now that's true. You know that. Oh, this the day that we're living. But he said, it shall be light about the evening time. A way to glory you will surely find. That's the day we're living in right now. The light will shine just at the evening when the darkness is setting in. Twilight time, the evening star. Twilight and evening star, and after that the dark. May there be no sadness of farewell when I'm at last in bark. All without is born of time and space, and the floods may bear me far. But I want to see my pilot face to face when I cross the bar. Tell me not in mournful numbers that life is just an empty dream, and the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Yea, life is real, and life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. For thus our to thus return us was not spoken of the soul. Lives of great men all remind us and we can make our lives sublime and partings leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another while sailing over life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother in seeing shall take heart again. Let us be up then and doing with a heart for any stride. Be not like dumb driven cattle. Be a hero in this. Dear God, they're yours. I've seen two men stand to their feet, Father. I pray, God, that you'll Take them now. They want to be your sons. They have woke up from the ignorance of the life that they have lived. And now they want to be afreshed anew with the baptism of the Holy Spirit upon that seed that's been planted in their hearts this day. Eternal God, the creator of all things, who made your word. And I believe that you knew these men would do this this morning. I pray, Lord, that you'll water that word day and night. Never let Satan to pluck it from your hand. May it be a tree that sometimes in the paradise of God, when it's all brought back again, for your word cannot fail, it'll be again for this world, and there will not be this kind of a civilization in the world to come. There'll be no automobiles or nothing that science has ever done. There will be no such things in the world that is to come, but it'll be God's own type of civilization that he'll set up in a glorious reign, for in this civilization... There is sickness, death, sorrow, graves, want. But in that kingdom that is to come, 
There is no death, no sorrow, no sickness, no old age. Oh, God, it will all be new there in your civilization. God, transform us today by your power, by the renewing of our minds, to turn from the meager elements of this world now unto the word of God. And may we be renewed by the transforming power of God upon the seed that's in our heart that we believe unto creatures called sons and daughters of God. This is my prayer to you, Father, for the people. In Jesus' name, amen. Now to you that's out into the broadcast, wherever you are, I want you to receive Christ out there as your personal Savior. Be filled with His Spirit. The words that's been said this morning, may they drop into your heart. And may there you receive Jesus and you watch your life and you see what you live afterwards and take the thinking men's filter here. If you see yourself doing something that's contrary to this word, move from it right quick. See, because there is a filter that keeps death away from you. That's God's word. His words are life and they will keep you from death. Do you people here now, it's in the auditorium. I've had you here a long time. I thank you for your attendance. I pray that God will never let this seed die. I hope you don't think I stand here just to say these things to be different. I say it because of love and knowing that while I'm mortal as I am now, it's the only time I'll ever be able to preach to people. And I love Jesus Christ. He's my Savior. And remember, I'd have been out there on the street if it hadn't been for Him. I'd have been out there. All my parents, all my people were sinners. But God, with His transforming power, I know it made a different creature out of me. And I can, I can recommend it to you to be good, and it'll keep in the hours of trouble. Even at death at the door, you have no fear. There's nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ. May God bless each one of you and give you eternal life. How many here that doesn't have the seed of God, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, would you just raise your hand and say, Remember me, Brother Bram, and I will receive that Holy Spirit. Now you take the word in your in your heart and believe. Now, if you, you can look at you, go up, look at the mirror, and you see where you are. You can know, you say, well, I didn't raise my hand because I believe I have. Look at yourself in the mirror. Then you see what kind of a spirit is deceiving you. Deceive, thinking there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. Is that true? Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down there for cleansing from sin, I cried. Oh, there to my heart was a blood of life. Glory. Just close your eyes and I'm singing it to you. Let's just raise your hands. And glory to his precious name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood of Glory to His name. I want you Christians to shake one another's hand and say, I am so one. So sweetly abiding there at the cross where he took me. Glory to his name. Glory to his precious name. Glory to His name. Oh, there to my heart was the blood of life. Glory to His name. The blood has a germ of life in it, you know. This is to the them who doesn't know Him. Oh, come. To this fountain so rich and sweet, cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Oh, plunge in today and we may come Glory.
Let's bow our heads now as we sing it. Glory to Love him. Paul said, I'll sing in the spirit, I'll worship in the spirit. Let's sing it real soft again with their hands up. You know, the trouble of it, we Pentecostal people, we've lost our joy. We've lost our emotions. As Billy Graham said the night, and preachers, collars turned around, going down south, clapping their hands and beating their feet up and down on the ground, stomping. They had something they were happy about. <laughs> Uh, we all got something I'm happy about. Oh, yeah, we've lost our emotions. Now, let's just raise our hands. Don't worry about the tears. They won't hurt nothing. See? And, you know, he that goeth forth sowing in tears will doubtless return again. Yes. Bring in precious sheep. Yes. Glory to his name. Precious name. Glory.